Hey, today I'll be talking about book four of Legend of Junhuan. This is the longest book and yet the shortest video because really very little actually happens. Junhuan arrives at the temple and is renamed. She meets all of the nuns from the drama, they are characterized exactly the same. Life's tough, they get used to it. There's a lot of monologuing of mental deduction as Junhuan unravels in her mind that the Empress and Lingrong must have been working together and Lingrong must have betrayed her long ago. Jingbai is an evil witch. The Empress Dowager's maid comes to see her with all the hot gossip. Lingrong was promoted to Fan Yi and she is now an imperial concubine. The Emperor selected 18 new concubines when she left, which she says is the highest number since he came into power, and not one of the girls is over 15. Junhuan, now 20, realizes the Emperor no longer wants girls who are old enough to think for themselves. Xuanqing got himself into a bit of trouble for speaking up for Junhuan's family, and that concludes the palace report. Thanks, girl! Surprisingly, we don't get that Junhuan confrontation scene with the consorts, it's entirely a drama invention. Junhuan doesn't see anyone from the harem except Mei Zhuang, but that isn't until much later. Dr. Wen starts seeing her whenever he can, making Junhuan very uncomfortable. Ganlu Temple was originally a pure place for nuns to live and practice in, but with him repeatedly rushing in so excitedly, I knew he was an imperial physician and an old acquaintance of mine, but the way he took such care of me... Though he didn't say anything to my face, something in his expression slowly became uncomfortable to look at. And others notice it too. Junhuan overhears some nuns gossiping about her and Dr. Wen, insinuating that he's doing more than just treating her illness. Junhuan starts avoiding being at home when she knows he's coming until one day she comes home and he has left a present for her. A beautiful little white jade pot. She opens it to find inside some pear slices cut into hearts and her heart drops. I hugged my knees, sat down in despair and said, why does he never understand? Why is he always so inappropriate? I rejected his affection for me before entering the palace. I didn't want it before, and I all the more don't want it now. I only regard him as a brother, as an old friend. Why can't he understand? Hanbi was also worried and said, Right now, it's not best to reject him directly. Back in the palace, both Princess Longyue and Shen Jieyu cannot be without his care. We're already so isolated here. Can we afford to lose his support? Mistress, you must think it through carefully. She thought for a moment and then continued. Master Wen has actually shown us quite a bit of care. I tilted my head and said calmly, he does take good care of me, but I really don't like him. Despite Huan Bi and Jing Shi's efforts, three days later, he returns and she returns his jade pot. Not beating around the bush, he says it's a family heirloom and his father told him to give it to the person he wants to spend his life with. He says his feelings have not changed from the first time he proposed to her till now. She rejects him again, and one of her reasons is that they know each other too well. She doesn't like that he has seen the worst parts of her. She says she has given up on men and truly does just want to live the monk life. Dr. Wen finally gets it and responds, Do you still remember when we first met? You peeled so many lotus seeds for me to eat. You were still young at that time and didn't know that you have to pick out the pits before eating them. Each one you gave me was so bitter so bitter that I almost couldn't swallow them. But because you had peeled them for me, I ate them despite how bitter they were. I ate them happily and only tasted sweetness. So as long as this is your decision today, no matter how sad or difficult to accept, I will accept it and respect your wishes. Dr. Wen is honestly such a good egg. She tells him to take the jade pot and give it to someone who loves him, and he leaves. Mo Yan heard a bit of what happened and tells her she did good, men are worthless. She tells Junhuan that when she was her age, she was also married and even gave birth to children. She did everything she was supposed to as a wife, except, arguably, the biggest thing, she couldn't give birth to a son. When she delivered her second daughter, her husband's family drowned her in a lake. She was then kicked out of the house as her husband followed his family's advice to find a new wife who could give him sons. Mo Yuan, left with nothing but her daughter, made her way to the temple and asked for a shelter. Her daughter was too young to stay, so she found her a family to live with in a village near the base of the mountain, where she still lives today while Mo Yan lives here in the temple. They can keep in touch, but her daughter really grew up without her. Mo Yan tells her that that ex-husband of hers actually came to find her not long ago. His new wife had also given birth to daughters, but she was nowhere near as capable as Mo Yan was at running the house. He asked her if she would be willing to come back. Then what did you say to him? Mo Yan's eyes shined with a light that was both gentle and cold. I only told him one thing, to bring back my dead little girl. As long as she could live again, I would go back with him. That repulsive man had nothing to say and could only hang his head and leave. Her tone became gentle and mournful. You have no idea how cute my little girl was. I loved her so much. It's such a pity that she was only on this earth for three days. Everything was peaceful. The sound of the wind passing through was like a sad whimper. 
Combined with Mo Yan's grief, it seemed especially sorrowful. Mo Yan smiled sadly. Do you know why I'm willing to share these things with you? I shook my head and smiled. Probably because you think I know how to keep a secret. She laughed silently and took my hand. It's because I can see that the pain in your heart is no less than mine. Moya never becomes much of a sweet talker, but Junhuan and her become very close and help each other whenever they can. Finally, Xuanqing comes to see her at the temple. He shows her the painting and she finally gets a look at her daughter. Standing on the bank, they see a teenage girl singing and rowing a boat and ask her if they can have a ride. They settle in and, recognizing her clothes, the girl is curious about why Junhuan hasn't cut her hair. She says her mother is a full monk with a shaved head and everyone must call her either sister or Mo Yan. Slightly surprised, I looked at the girl and said, Is Mo Yan your mother? Looking closely, I saw that although the girl was not as tall, her facial expressions mirrored Mo Yan's exactly. She nodded and said happily, Yes, do you know my mother? I nodded. She has taken great care of me. The girl seems to have grown up really well. She's sweet, friendly, and has a great sense of humor. Junhuan, of course, can't help but think about how her own daughter will grow up without her. We, of course, can't see what's going on in the palace, so it's continually relayed to us through reports from Fang Ruo, Xuan Xing, and occasionally Dr. Wen. Ling Rong is now An Ronghua, and Qi is now Guan Shun Yi. They're quite favored, along with some new additions, including Imperial Concubine Chang, that is Chang Pin, who is pregnant. Junhuan meets Xuan Qing's mom, and in a plot point that was completely removed from the drama, she belongs to an ethnic minority, Bai Yi Ren. From the description in the book, it seems they don't look much different from everyone else, but their eyes are lighter brown. Xu shares some information about her old life with her. They get along well, and Junhuan promises to bring back her instrument next time. The next time she comes, Xuan Qing is there, and she's also brought along Huan Bi. In a crazy little side plot, we get Huan Bi's origin story as Huan Bi recognizes the language Xu speaks with Xuan Qing. It is discovered that her mother was from the same tribe Xu is from, and they actually knew each other. There was a big war and they both fled to the capital together. She ended up in the palace while Huan Bi's mother fell in love with Junhuan's father and got pregnant with Huan Bi. Because of her identity, she could never marry him, but she loved him all the same. In fact, she changed her name to Mian Mian in reference to a line from a poem. Qing Qing He Bian Cao, Mian Mian Si Yuan Dao. Mian Mian here is her name and Yuan Dao is Junhuan's father's name, Zhen Yuan Dao. Her original name was Bi Zhu, which is where Huan Bi's name came from. Huan Bi is shaken to her core to find out about where she came from and very happy to learn that her mother wasn't just a random fling, they really did love each other. All right, now we fall into Xuan Qing and Zhen Huan time. Xuan Qing suggests marrying Huan Bi to A Jin. Huan Bi's like, that's just because you want to get closer to Zhen Huan. It's awkward, Zhen Huan reestablishes boundaries. Xuan Qing is supposed to get married, Zhen Huan congratulates him and he's like, you know damn well I don't want to marry this girl. Zhen Huan re-reestablishes boundaries. Meanwhile, back at the palace, Imperial Concubine Chang is promoted to De Yi and renamed Hu, so she's now Hu De Yi. She delivers a princess, but will never be able to get pregnant again thanks to some scheming by the Empress. Junhuan gets super sick, she's kicked out of the temple by the mean nuns and passes out. She wakes up at Chunqing's palace, he's been taking care of her day and night, she's touched. Junhuan finds out he did that snow angel thing, she decides to accept him, but oh no, Xuanqing has company. It's totally the same except Hu De Yi is also there, but she doesn't say anything important. Junhuan realizes this is all a pipe dream and re 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 establishes boundaries. Chapter 20 is Xuanqing doing nice things for Junhuan and she's all, he's so sweet, but I can't, but he's so sweet, but I mustn't. Chapter 21 is more back and forth. Have you ever been in love? N no, but I will I have, so there. Huanbi is getting fed up with the back and forth and tells her to stop making Xuanqing sad. Junhuan decides they should leave his palace. Later, she runs into him again at Xu's place where their crazy chemistry just won't quit. Chao Xiao Si. On their way home, he confesses to her again. She rejects him again. A cat comes into her room, he saves her, he plays the flute in the rain, and finally, she runs out and accepts him. You literally could not pay me enough to try and voice act the sappy things they say to each other, but just know they are very much in love. I like romance, but I'm starting to feel like that kid from Princess Bride. Oh no, no, please, no kissing again. They tell his mom she is happy and excited. We get more lovey-dovey stuff as Huan Bi becomes more jealous and moody. Huan Bi had always been quiet, but the way she looked at me gradually became gloomier. I decided that if she didn't say it, I wouldn't take the initiative to ask. I would just pretend that I didn't know. She addresses her concerns with Jin Shi, who is like, yup, just play dumb. Becoming more confident that no one is paying attention to them, Xuan Qing and Zhen Huan go on a trip. Huan Bi comes along and continues to be moody and jealous. They climb a mountain together where they find a man and a woman both bitten by snakes. They save the man, but it's too late for the woman. 
When Jun Huan realizes that the woman is going to die a slow death, she takes Xuan Qing's knife and stabs her in the heart. Xuan Qing is shocked and Huan Bi screams, but Jun Huan slaps her to shut up before she starts an avalanche. Xuan Qing asks how she could so coldly end a human life, and she asks incredulously if they were supposed to sit and watch her die. Xuan Qing shook his head silently, then raised his head suddenly, his eyes dark. Fan Er, I admit that your actions weren't wrong. He closed his eyes tightly, almost sighing. But I never expected you could be so vicious. Vicious? I almost sneered, his words causing a surge of anger to rush out from somewhere deep in my heart. I smiled fiercely. You find me vicious, I said in a cold tone. Do you think the Jun Huan in front of you, who lived through life in the harem, is some spotless, innocent, sweet sheep ready to be taken advantage of? I sneered. Viciousness is a special skill of mine. I killed her to save her, but she's certainly not the first person to die by my hand. Yep, it's been too much happiness for these two, apparently, and it's time for their first fight. She asks if he's disappointed that she isn't actually what he imagined she would be, and they stare at each other in icy silence for a while until the man suddenly wakes up. He says the woman she killed was his wife, pregnant with their third child, though that doesn't stop him from being just as gross as he was in the drama with the gall to wake up from the brink of death and immediately start lusting after his savior. Xuan Qing gets angry and it looks like it might get physical, so Jun Huan motions to Huan Bi to stab the man in the shoulder, which he does. He's too weak to fight what with the snake bite and the stab wound, and he leaves his wife's body behind without a glance back, saying as he goes that she owes him a new wife since she took his last one. I really didn't think Moga could get any worse, but there you have it. Jun Huan apologizes to Huan Bi for hitting her, but Huan Bi understands. They make up, but Jun Huan remains angry at Xuan Qing for a while until he apologizes, understanding that with what she's been through, it isn't fair to hold her to his idealistic standards. We find out that the emperor has a new favorite, Fu Wan Yi, selected during the most previous concubine selection. She bears a resemblance to Jun Huan and so also to the previous empress. Dr. Wen finds out about their relationship and it's just like in the drama. Then more Xuan Qing and Jun Huan being in love and you know what? Just to show you how slow this is, here you go. The whole start of this chapter is Jun Huan going out to a field to pick some flowers. And you're already not getting the full experience because I'm not narrating every single flower and bird she passes by. She actually does this. Xuan Qing comes to visit while she's out, but after waiting for a while, has to return. Guessing where she is, he leaves her a note telling her to enjoy the flowers. Jun Huan comes back and finds this note. He obviously knew how easy it would have been to find me on the mountaintop. He only had to go to where the flowers flourished and there I would be. But he would rather wait here for me quietly. He hadn't wanted to interrupt me joyfully picking flowers in the spring air. He was willing to wait like this, wait just in case I came back a bit early. His meticulous care, his simple and warm sentiments, it almost made tears fall from my eyes. His love for me was so generous and patient. It's now been... 11 chapters since she accepted him and it is all written like this release me from this prison <laughs> all right they get married the emperor gets sick and Xuan Qing goes to see him apparently he started vomiting blood while at his new favorite girl's place that was fu wanyi if you remember earlier recently promoted so now she's fu jie yu don't worry if you can't remember her name Xuan Qing comes back and reports that she has been killed apparently the doctor reported the emperor was poisoned and the poison was found with Fu Jiayu. The empress decided to have her executed before the emperor even woke up. The emperor had been paying Fu exclusive attention and seemed very much into her, so Jun Huan and Ko think this must have been a plot to get rid of Fu. When the emperor woke up and heard the news that Fu was dead, he just said it was a pity since such a beauty was hard to come by. And that was the end of it. Xuan Qing is a bit afraid by how cold his brother is becoming, but Jun Huan is not really surprised. Huan Bi wants to learn how to read, Jun Huan thinks it's obvious who that's for, but again decides to just ignore Huan Bi's obvious feelings. According to her thoughts, it's a mixture of pity, guilt, and total confidence that Xuan Qing will never spare her a glance. Xuan Qing, Jun Huan, and Huan Bi are traveling again one day and see a fancy carriage. They are surprised to learn that it belongs not to some minister's daughter, but a famous courtesan named Miss Gu. Jun Huan catches a glimpse and finds her breathtaking, but also a bit familiar? Her carriage driver is happy to gossip and says there are dozens of men who are head over heels for her. He says there was even a man who was ready to throw away his parents and his pregnant wife and pay the hefty sum to redeem her body just to be with her. I was suddenly filled with a vague uneasiness as if near a brewing storm. My chest felt extremely tight. I had an indistinct feeling. That woman's appearance, though I had only had a glance, that woman vaguely resembled An Lingrong. 
That's right, baby, it's Jia Yi, and since the fall of the Jun family, she has made quite a name for herself. Jun Huan, of course, wants to confront her, and Xuan Xing has to physically bar her from sprinting after the carriage. There's no way to confront her without revealing her identity and bringing unwanted attention to herself. At least they know where she is now, so they just have to play it smart and bide their time. He promises that he will never give up on helping her clear her family's name. But in the meantime, they plan their Romeo and Juliet escape where she will be faking her death. First, he has one last job to do and then he will definitely be back in a month. Definitely. We get pages and pages of Junhuan missing him and hoping he comes back, and three weeks later, Mei Zhuang is finally able to come to the temple. She comes to report to Junhuan that her brother has lost his mind, literally, not figuratively. So Junhuang was exiled before Xue and his son got sick, and he hadn't heard the news about their deaths until recently when someone went out of their way to send him the message. The news completely broke him, and they need to find a way to bring him back to the capital for treatment. Just as Junhuan is thinking that her family will never stop suffering, she finds out she's pregnant, and then Dr. Wen brings the news that Xuan Qing's boats capsized and his body was not found. Spit up blood, pass out, end of book four. Yeah, easily my least favorite of the books, though I will admit that part of that is because I've already seen this in the drama, so this was all just like a much slower version of that. Maybe I would have liked it more if I were reading it for the first time. And also, since Chinese is not my mother tongue, and I'm not even that good at it really, it's just a stab in the heart to spend 15 minutes trying to figure out what a metaphor means only for it to boil down to something like, Xuan Qing's eyes are like pretty marbles. Having to pour over each word really takes all the romance and fun out of it, and I'm just left rolling my pretty marbles. I know this is also a lot of people's least favorite part in the drama, so there's that. It's definitely not as fun as actually experiencing any palace drama, you're just having people come to the mountain and tell Junhuan what happened. It was really cool to hear Moyen's backstory though. Damn, I love that woman. The most exciting thing to me here though is Jia Yi. I'm so curious about her story. Like what in the world happened to her? So from what we know, she was in on the plan from the beginning. She knew she was being used. She got a nice paycheck out of it. So why did she even betray the Jun family? Just for a bigger paycheck or was there something deeper there? And it's also interesting to me that rather than have her body redeemed, she decided to take the money and then continue on to become the number one courtesan in the land. The way everyone is so respectful of her carriage in the scene where she's reintroduced, she clearly has a lot of power despite her, you know, position. One more random note. Xuan Qing has a tattoo on his arm, an iron chain wrapped around a sword covered in vines patterned with blood spatters. It's giving rebellious teenager. Anyway, is this important to the story? Almost certainly not. I don't know, just sharing. In any case, transition over, and now we move on to the next phase, getting back into the harem. Not looking forward to Xuan Qing's return. Till next time, thanks for watching.